if, if you look at the history books, there's so many ways and, and lands that the Vikings have ultimately conquered. So, is there at any point where we start to look at Iceland as, as, a, as a potential spot? And I know that it may not be the same Floki, or maybe it is, but there was the Floki yeah. who, who discovered uh, Iceland. Yeah. Well, it depends how long this can be the show going. I, I've told them privately that I want to keep the show going until we discover America. Oh, that's awesome. You know, um, we're going to Paris actually this season. It's a huge change, step change for the Vikings because who knew, you know, I mean, a little while ago there was one boat going across to England and now there's a hundred boats showing I went to Iceland last January myself it's an amazing place, I mean, we would love to talk about it. Uh, but they also, they colonize Greenland. Now, Greenland, I mean, there's nothing in Greenland. And uh, there were certainly no minerals or trees. So they had to find minerals or trees. So they carried on sailing, and that's why they found Nova Scotia. That's why they found Canada. And it was just to get so all being well. But whilst this was happening, and they were kind of going west and Bjorn, Ragnar told his son, sailed into the Mediterranean, and he sailed to Spain. And he, he attacked what he thought was Rome, so he attacked a city in Italy. He was pursued by Mediterranean pirates. I mean, these guys are awesome, you know. And then there was an example in a relatively short period of time. And this was, so this is the dawn. I think season three is very much like this is the dawn of the Viking Age. You know, before this, there's one or two boats going, managing to find maybe Ireland, maybe England. But here they come, you know, they, they now have very confident, they have great confidence in their boats, in their ability to sail across open water. They, they, they get information about other places and they go for it. But I always think it's, what is amazing about them is how few of them manage to do so much. If you think that, you know, they're going to other countries, and even if they have a big fleet, if they have 30 ships or something, 25, 30 warriors, they don't know what's going to happen when they reach this other land, which is several, obviously going to be usually much bigger than Scandinavia. It's going to have armies of thousands. They have no way of doing that. So apart from anything else, they've got to be very clever about how they operate. They do, and, and, and they got in. They were very clever in the way that they negotiated with, divided and ruled. But one of the other things that they did was shock and awe. One of the reasons that the Vikings have such an incredible reputation for violence, for brutality, is because it served them very well. If, if people hear that the Vikings are coming, it scares you shit. <laughs> Even though the Vikings have only got 200 men and you've got an army of 5,000, I'm running away. I am not going to fight them. So it was their best. Terrible reputation they have, I think, has created public liberty. Michael, could you talk about how Vikings was developed as a series? Did History Channel come to you, or did you approach them? Uh, no, um, NGM came to me, because uh, they owned the rights to an old film called Vikings, and they were thinking about uh, you know, perhaps developing that. And, uh, the, but I knew about the Vikings anyway. I, I'd been writing about, I read a script about Alfred the Great, who was a Saxon ruler who fought the Vikings after Elizabeth in, the, in about 98 or 99. And I started to, to read about Viking culture. And I was finding all these things I never knew that blew my mind, you know, how their attitude towards women was, was much more enlightened than all the other cultures around, that they were a democratic you know, community. Uh, and I just said, my God, these guys have got a bad press. You know? and I, so I was waiting for the opportunity to write it. NTM asked me. I said, sure. And we took it to history. And I'm very glad we took it to history. For two reasons. One is that I think anything that's on the History Channel, you can assume, more or less, it's 
going to be serious. History is going to be based on serious history. So I wanted that impression in terms of the Sunni Alliance. Uh, I kind of very proud of the historical background of this the research. And the other thing was, it was because the, it was their first scripted series, I thought they'd leave us alone. Because <laughs> 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 they've straightened up and they've been absolutely wonderful. So, so that's how it is. Religion, both uh, Viking religion and Christianity, has played such a heavy, heavy presence in this series. How is that going to be expanded upon in the next? Well, um, it has. It is very vital, and I would never have even started to write this if I couldn't have explored the gods or the pagan gods. So, uh, the very real rivalry between Christian and pagan religion. To the pagans, Christianity was a jumped up another young religion which had borrowed a lot from their own gods and practices. And, and it was really interesting to find a character like Athelstan who, who could reflect this conflict. Uh, there were monks, and there was the evidence of three monks who were captured by the Vikings who came back fighting. And in, in season three, Athelstan's story is very interesting, very interesting, the way that that is. The twists and turns in that particular art and that story are, for me, some of the most satisfying things I've written. I love the character, but I also love the conflict. And I love, you know, fitting together, I mean, Loki in a way, Pagan fundamentalist. You know, he's always worried that Athelstan is, is corrupting, right? You know, taking him away from true pagan beliefs. Because Ragnar is obviously deeply affected by Athelstan, loves him, and, and is affected by this. And on the other hand, you have King Egbert, you have the Wessex people, and you have Egbert's son is a fundamentalist Christian. So, Can relate to it. You know, it's about fathers and sons and wives and husbands. And it's about spirituality. And I like writing about spirituality. In Elizabeth, I like to be about spirituality. Because she replaced the time. And in Tudor's, the destruction of the Catholic religion in England. It was interesting to me that I, I had a conversation.
station on air was at the Boston radio station with the head of the Scandinavian Star at Harvard. He's a Swedish professor. We showed him the first two episodes, the first season before we went on air. And I thought this guy was going to eat me alive. And he said, This is the first time my culture has ever been seriously And I think because people feel that's kind of not enough to tell. You know, they didn't make a prison record until they think that's all they have to make it up. But when we were pitching it to history, I said, we're in New York. I said, walk out of this door, walk three blocks, you look past seven people. Profound effect. I mean, at one stage, the whole centre of England was all over the plains. That's where it was dangerous. So I think it's a, a, I think it's a missed opportunity for people uh, not to study like things. But I do think that even history teachers have been glittering up on this unfair view, which of course is propaganda by Christian monks. And we've all bought into it. We all think it's. Silly guys, uh, well, I'm going to help it.